And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all of Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him, and he healed them all. He lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who now who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and when they revile you, and spurn your name as evil, on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry." Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Church, good to see everyone in 2024. It's already starting out to be a, an interesting year for sure. So we are going to start this morning a little bit different way. I want you to turn to the person next to you and share with them an example of how God has blessed you recently, okay? Go ahead. Turn to the person next to you. Uh, share an example of how God has blessed you recently. We're turning behind you. <laughs> All right. So, how many of you said something like, God has recently blessed me with bankruptcy? Raise your hand. <laughs> Anybody say, God has blessed me with a big old heaping pot of suffering? Raise your hand. Anybody say, God has blessed me with being rejected by the people I love most in the world. Anybody? In fact, most of our examples of, of blessing tend to be very earthy, don't they? Um, something he did for you that is really, man, that was awesome. Got a raise, got a promotion, got a girlfriend, got whatever. Got into the school that I wanted to get into, and that kind of thing. And so it's interesting that in this passage where Jesus is teaching us that followers of, Jesus, of, of his followers should expect earthly troubles and eternal satisfaction, that he attaches the word blessing and blessed to earthly troubles and to the eternal satisfaction. Both the suffering and the bankrupt and all those things, those are also blessings from God. And we don't think that way, do we? Not at all. So this passage is Luke's version of Jesus' most uh, famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And let's just say up front that there are discrepancies between Luke's version, which is one chapter, and Matthew's version, which is three chapters. Um, now, there's, there's some obvious reasons why that may be. For example, Matthew's audience is a Jewish audience, and he's writing to them to convince them that Jesus is the Messiah. And so he includes in his version of the Sermon of the Mount a bunch of, of teachings that Jesus gave about the law because Jews are concerned with, were concerned with the law of Moses, and Jesus had a lot to say about the law of Moses. But Luke's audience is not Jewish. His audience are Gentiles. Remember Theophilus and and so that's not material that he felt was germane, apparently, to the Gentile audience. And, and there's another reason why. There's no, there's no reason for us to believe that what Luke is giving us was the exact same sermon on the exact same occasion that Matthew was giving us. Uh, anybody who knows preachers, and certainly every preacher knows, 
that when we go to a different place to preach, we often do what? Preach the same thing over again that our home church has heard. And we might change it a little bit, but you know, we, we do that and we, because God gave us that message and, and it's, it makes sense that as Jesus went from area to area to area, that there was a commonality in what he was preaching in these different areas. But as much as there are discrep- some discrepancies, the most importantly is the similarity, which is the theme in this sermon, that Jesus is preaching to us the gospel of the kingdom and he's teaching us what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. This sermon is radical. It is revolutionary. It is countercultural because the gospel that Jesus is preaching rejects the values of the worldly kingdom. For example, one author wrote that those whom the world congratulates, Jesus pities, and those whom the world regards as losers, Jesus declares to have gotten it right, totally upside down, countercultural to what would be the norm. If you want to, want to understand what it means to be a Christian and what it means to follow Jesus, this sermon in Luke chapter 6 lays it out for us. This, this morning's passage, the, what we would call the Beatitudes, is kind of like the introduction. Maybe it's the first point of his sermon, but a lot of it's like the introduction to his sermon. Uh, Jesus in this passage is very much taking up the mantle of the Old Testament prophet. He is exercising the, the, the mannerisms and the voice of those great prophets like Isaiah and uh, Jeremiah who would come to God's people and declare to them the blessings that would, could come their way if they obeyed the covenant and the woes that would come their way because of disobedience. So like those prophets, he begins with a set of blessings or beatitudes and, that, and woes that are intended to encourage those who are following him, the believers, and it's intended to challenge those who are seekers, who are looking at answers, and they are checking Jesus out, and they were coming from all around the countryside, from as far north as Lebanon down to Jerusalem, to hear this prophet give his message. So we're going to begin this morning with the blessings of godliness. Verse 20 says, he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, blessed are you. Now, what kind of person receives the blessings and the grace of God? Disciples, the person who has repented of their sins and has committed their life to Jesus Christ, who is following Jesus. So Jesus in these opening verses is very much speaking to his disciples. He says this, looking at his disciples, he says, and then he uses that second person pronoun, you. He's speaking specifically to them, you. And so these beatitudes are important because for all of us who follow Jesus, Jesus is saying something explicit to us. These beatitudes, they contain four related descriptions of one kind of person, the kind of person who experiences God's saving grace and mercy and has his ultimate blessings upon his life. This list that he gives in these Beatitudes is a common experience for believers throughout time and around the world. So commonly, as you look at the kingdom of God through history, those who most easily follow Jesus are the poor. And that's where he starts. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now, in this statement, Jesus is not saying that we should all sell everything that we have and follow a life of poverty. Some people have taken it like that through the centuries, and they sell everything, and they give it away, and they live a life of deprivation. But that's not what is going on here. What is going on is Jesus is just simply describing a reality of life, that those who are poor are more open to the scriptures. I think it's important that he did start with this characteristic of those who commonly follow Jesus, because 
Jesus is revealing his love for the poor and the importance of the poor in our city, for example, hearing the gospel from us that our church reaches out to the poor and those who are materially in need. They need the gospel, and they have the dignity of being created in the image of God just as much as someone who is more prosperous. So I appreciate the fact that Jesus starts with the poor because commonly those who end up following Jesus either come out of the ranks of the poor or at some point in life experience a form of poverty. So this word, when he says, blessed are the poor, in the book of Luke, it is very much to be taken literally. In Matthew, it's much more metaphorical, spiritual. Blessed are the poor in spirit. But Luke goes to the fleshly, earthly reality of what is going on. Jesus is very practical, very pragmatic. He's just alluding to something that many of us have observed, maybe we even lived it at one point in our life, that the rich person or the person who has their material needs easily met is often too proud and too self-reliant for the gospel, but not so the poor. The poor, this humble station in life that requires a daily reliance upon God's grace and his mercy just for the normal things that you need to survive. And so it makes the truth of the gospel more beautiful and more easily embraced. But in the Bible, this word poor is a complicated word. It's not always talking about material deprivation. We've already referred in previous sermons, we described Joseph and Mary as being a part of what was known as the pious poor. Yes, Joseph had a job, an occupation, a carpenter. He could provide for his family, but certainly he wasn't living high on the hog. And and that's okay. In the Bible, there's a rich tradition of what is known as the pious poor. Those prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, as they proclaimed the blessings and the woes to the exiles who were in Babylon, those blessings were given to what were known as the pious poor. In the the book of Psalms, chapter 40, verse 17, through the inspiration of the Spirit, King David writes, as for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer, but do not delay, O my God. Question, was King David a poor person? As we think of poor? No. In fact, he was probably the richest person in the land, in the nation. He was incredibly wealthy. If you read later in his life and you look at all the money he donated to the building of the temple by today's values, it's billions of dollars. Apparently, they had supply chain problems also, (laughs) right? (laughs) Their own form of covid to delay their project, I don't know. But he was, a, he was materially very wealthy, yet he's described as poor. He's, he's piously poor. In other words, he had the same heart attitude that someone has who is materially, physically poor. This is good news for us, by the way, because most of us in here by biblical standards, by even the standards of the world today, we are not poor. And if Jesus is saying, you can only be my disciple if you are materially without possessions, then we're all in trouble. But when we understand that he's talking about a pious poor, an attitude towards humble reliance upon God and his grace, we understand what this beatitude and this blessing is saying. Jesus is asserting the value of his eternal kingdom over the materialistic kingdom of the world. So, if entering into a state of poverty is the consequence of allegiance to Jesus, he says, so be it. If the loss of worldly possessions is the result of allegiance and following Jesus, well, so be it. There's greater value in being part of Jesus's kingdom than being rich in the world's currency. 
Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. There's the poor, there's the hungry. Earthly poverty and hunger often are associated with it, aren't they? And while I, don't, I doubt any of us this morning started our day saying, I don't know if I'm going to have any food for today. We have brothers and sisters around the world that that's very much their reality. It is a common experience for those who follow Jesus to wonder about their food and where it's going to come from. And God's promise to all of us is that our earthly needs are going to be met when we rely upon him and his sustaining grace. When we commit our lives to him, he takes care of our needs. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, Do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. As important as physical hunger is, though, there's an even more important type of hunger. And it's a hunger, as Jesus says here, for righteousness. A hunger for God's glory in this world. Jesus' disciples, common characteristic of all of Jesus' disciples is that they are hungry for God's glory and presence in their lives. So what are you hungry for? What are you hungry for this morning? Are you hungry for the things of this world? Is that What is first and foremost in your mind and in your heart and in your agendas? Or are you hungry for the glory and the presence of God in your life? When your primary hunger is a heavenly hunger, Jesus' promise is true in this life and for our future one. You shall be satisfied. So blessed are the poor. Blessed are the hunger. The next two characteristics we're going to combine, those who are sorrowful and rejected. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, so far, so far, for so their fathers did to the prophets." To follow Jesus is to see the realities of this earthly kingdom through a different lens. We see the evil. We see the deprivation, the injustice, the hatred between nations and races. And we know, we know that this is not the way it is supposed to be. Our hearts are broken and we mourn over the destructiveness of sin in our society and we see example after example after example flooding the news and our social media streams. We mourn and we weep as followers of Jesus over those whom we love when they reject the gospel message. And in that rejection of the gospel message, they often reject the messenger of that gospel message. And so we've experienced that pain of scorn and rejection for loved ones. The original audience, they faced extreme ostracism. When Jesus is speaking to these disciples and those who will follow him in first century Palestine, when he said, blessed are the poor and the hunger and those who sorrow and who are rejected, this was a very real ending for many of them, a reality of their life, because when they committed their life to Jesus, it was common to be expelled, to be excommunicated from the synagogue. And to be excommunicated from the synagogue meant you are now ostracized by your family. You can be disinherited and kicked out and lose that family business and the portion of the farm and and everything else that uh, allowed you to make a living. Hunger is now a reality in your life. You lose these relationships that had been lifelong, and many of them are your family, those that you love the most because you now were following Jesus. Now, most of us 
We haven't faced that extreme of a form of ostracism, but many of us in here have experienced a more passive or a lesser form of that. Some of you right now, I know because I know your stories, you grieve over the loss of the relationship with your sister or your brother or your parents or other loved ones because you follow Jesus and you follow his kingdom and the word of God and they do not And because you do not agree with them on certain social issues or certain uh, cultural doctrines that have become their own form of religion, they want nothing to do with you now. They've cut you out of their life. They've said things to you. If you believe something is so stupid and old-fashioned, written by a bunch of men from the first century, we can't have a relationship. And you felt those wounds in the core of your soul. And you're experiencing what Jesus said you were going to experience. And somehow, that's a blessing. That's hard to understand, isn't it? Because it certainly doesn't feel that way. You experience the scorn of coworkers, the intolerance of the supposedly tolerant. But church, understand, Paul tells us to expect this. He says... All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. The poor in Christ, you who are poor in Christ, you who are hungry for righteousness and are mourning or being persecuted and rejected because of your allegiance to Jesus, you who are living out the gospel and paying a price for your loyalty to Jesus should be comforted and encouraged by this passage. You are blessed. The whole kingdom of God belongs to you with all of its spiritual riches in this life and in the life to come. They are theirs for, your, for eternity. So one day, your poverty is going to be met with the overwhelming wealth and riches of our heavenly Father. Your hunger is going to be eternally satiated when we sit at the the table of the Lord and we enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb for all of eternity. Our sorrow one day is going to be exchanged for eternal laughter and joy. And our rejection is going to be met with the rewards of our Savior who pours them out upon us for our allegiance to him. This is our destiny. These are the blessings of godliness. So how about the woes of worldliness? Not only was Jesus speaking to disciples, the large portion of the audience were not followers yet of Jesus. And his message to them was this, woe to you. Who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. I want you to underline the words have received in verse 24. Those words have received in verse 24, they, they, they have the meaning of being Paid in full. Paid in full would be a literal translation. You have been paid in full. This is all you're going to get. And in other words, Jesus is saying, if you set your heart on what this world values and you put your energy and you pursue those things at best, that's all you will ever get. You're paid in full. Now underline the word woe. Woe. A word that means how sad, how tragic, how horrible. For those of you who are seekers, you're looking for, you haven't committed your life to Christ yet, I want you to hear the compassion and the love that Jesus has for you this morning. In that little word, woe, how tragic. How sad, how tragic 
that you are so focused on money, believing that you will get comfort and security from it. Oh, you may get the money, but that is all you will get. That's it. You're paid in full. What you won't get is true comfort and eternal security. Leon Morris writes, when all that anyone has is worldly wealth, he is poor indeed. That kind of prosperity goes with an inner emptiness. Comfort is not to be mistaken with blessedness. Did you hear that? Comfort is not to be mistaken with blessedness. How sad it is to fill your life with the things that the world values. You may get all of those things, but they only bring temporary satisfaction. And the deep-seated hunger is still there. How horrible to see your life and to fill it with experiences and good times and recreation and toys and, and substances in order to relieve your fear, your anxiety, your worry, your sorrow, your lack of purpose and meaning in life. How horrible it is because when the rush of that experience is over, when the hangover headache has finally dissipated and the memories of that incredible night are over, all of that sorrow and deep-seated hunger and fear and anxiety comes crashing back into your life because the bottle can't solve it. The toy does not satisfy the deep hunger. They're all still there. All you really get is that little experience. And after you've had enough of them, there's just despair, just despair. Serious, important words to us this morning from Jesus. So what? What do we do with it? I think there's three gospel applications in this passage for us this morning. The first is for those of you who are seekers. I want you to understand, you need to understand this morning that rejecting Jesus, it, it, it can have temporary advantages from a worldly perspective, but ultimately there are tragic eternal consequences. The answer to that emptiness, the answer to that sorrow, that lack of comfort, that need that you have, that driving all controlling hunger is to commit your life to Jesus. He says to you this morning, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. I hope this morning you will take these words of Jesus, and after the service, come and speak with me. Come and speak with one of our pastors or Stephen ministers at the care table. Let us talk to you about this inner hunger, this lack of satisfaction that is in your life, and how Jesus and only Jesus can satisfy it. I hope you do so this morning. Christian, applications for us. Let's understand that following Jesus is costly. Nowhere, nowhere will you read Jesus promising us the temporary blessings and the material wealth and the physical health that the prosperity gospel proclaims. Most television channels that you turn on, the gospel that is being proclaimed out of the mouths of those men and women is out of the pit. It is a false gospel. It is a false gospel. And you know it because their focus is all on the earthly blessings. Jesus, is, Jesus promises us that when we follow him, it is a certainty that we will have trials and tribulations of many different kinds. It is a certainty. Following Jesus is costly. And I think I mentioned a few weeks ago that there's a movie coming out in 2024 that I'm really looking forward to. I, I think maybe for the first time I may encourage us as a church to go see a movie together. 
It has nothing to do with Star Wars or Lord of the Rings, okay? Um, you know, there's a great biography written, uh, I don't know, maybe 20 years now. Eric Metaxas wrote a biography on the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and they've used that as the source for a movie on Dietrich Bonhoeffer's life. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is one of the modern, I think, modern heroes of the faith. He was a German pastor, a dedicated man of God, and who, who as Hitler rose to power in Germany, and the national church that, that Bonhoeffer was a pastor in compromised and began to cooperate with Hitler and the, the Socialist Party and, the, Na- and the, um, the Nazi Party and their agenda. Bonhoeffer stood up and opposed it. And he led a group of pastors who, who would not go along with the program, and they, they paid the price. Ultimately, Bonhoeffer was imprisoned, and just days before the war ended in Europe, he was executed for his faith. He wrote some classic books, one of them being The Cost of Discipleship. If you've never read it, you should. It's one of those Christian books like Mere Christianity and some others that have been written in the 20th century that should be read. And in that book, he says this, Suffering, then, is the badge of true discipleship. The disciple is not above his master. Discipleship means allegiance to the suffering Christ, and it is therefore not at all surprising that Christians should be called upon to suffer. In fact, it is a joy and a token of his grace. Those who follow Jesus, they inevitably suffer and face trials and yet bizarrely learn to take value in that suffering. The more we follow Jesus, the more we begin to realize that there is a blessedness attached to trials and tribulations because there are aspects of our salvation, the grace of God, the character of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life, the improvement of our witness to those that we love the most that happens as we experience the blessing of God pouring out his grace and his empowering mercy in our lives when we suffer. And so for those of you who are suffering this morning, and some of you are going through some of the worst suffering, you know what I'm talking about. When you commit to following Jesus, he redeems our trials and tribulations. When you do not commit to following Jesus as Lord and Savior and bow before him, your trials and your tribulations crush you. And they are not a blessing. It is woe. Whoa. So Christian, following Jesus is costly. And secondly, loyalty to Jesus results in eternal comfort and commendation. Isn't it awesome that the end of our story, the end of our story and everything that we go through in this earthly life, the end of our story is described with the word Blessed. Blessed. That's the final word on your story from our Savior. It comes from the Greek word makarios. It means privileged, fortunate, happy, blessed. The Apostle John, he writes of that day when he says in 1 John 3, Beloved, We are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. There is a great reversal in value coming our way. Right now, we suffer. We may be poor and hungry. We may be mourning and sorrowful. We may be rejected. But there is coming a day when once and for all, God and our Savior will declare over us, blessed. We will be transformed in the image of our Savior. And how can this happen? Because the greatest reversal of all that has ever taken place is what Jesus experienced. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, 
Yet for your sake he became poor, so that, by you, that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Jesus' gospel is a reversal of these earthly values. And he himself went through the greatest of all reverses. When he who was blessed in the presence of the angels and our heavenly father took on human flesh so that our woe could be put upon his back when he climbed the tree. But because he was willing to be reversed in such a way, we have blessed attached to our destiny. Praise be to our Lord Jesus Christ. May we follow him this week as faithful disciples. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for taking on our woes, the woe of sin and all attached to it, so that we could be blessed, both here today in this aspect of your kingdom and in the eternal kingdom to come. May we serve you well this week. May you honor, may we, may we honor you with our lives. And Lord Jesus, for the one or two or more who's here this morning that has yet to commit their life to you, may even today you convince them in the quiet of their soul that the only thing, only one who can satisfy the deep hunger and need that they have is you. May they take that step of faith and respond to the invitation that is given to them. In your name we ask these things, Jesus. Amen.